Hi, my name is Jimmy Adcock and I was part of the GFIS team for the Broughton Roman Villa shoot and together with my colleague Mike Langton, we were responsible for the GPR survey. Now, I'm hoping that everyone is really enjoying the new time team format because one of the great things about that format is that it allows us to really expand the stories that we tell compared to when we only had 45 minutes of edited material that we could put out. But for me, still not enough time to geek out massively about geophysics and specifically in this case, geek out about GPR. So my plan for this video is to have a little look at the hardware that we used at Broughton and then a lot of a look um, at the data that we collected, primarily the, the Roman Villa site. And uh, I don't want to go into the conclusions that came out of the episode. So don't worry if you haven't seen it yet. What I want to do in this video is try and recreate the kind of conversations and thought processes that we had when we first looked at that data. What are the features that jump out at us? What does that tell us about the villa, about the wider context, and how does that impact the interpretations that we make? So that's the plan. So if I just share my screen, we can talk a little bit about the hardware first of all. So in the old days, a GPR survey was always done with a single channel instrument. That meant single transmitter firing the radio waves into the ground and single receiver to record the reflections that came off of anywhere where we had a change in material. And you would push that across the site and that would collect one line of data. You'd then turn around, move 25, 50 centimetres into your survey area and then you'd go back again. And now you have two lines of data and you would keep that going until you covered the whole area. So pretty laborious. On the last series of the original time teams, um, we were lucky enough to have a multi-channel system at our disposal. Now, multi-channel systems, this means that they have more than one transmitter and more than one receiver um, in operation at the same time. And uh, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. You can push them, you can pull them. We were towing it behind a quad bike at Broughton, but they all operate on the same principle. Big box, a whole bunch of receivers um, and a whole bunch of transmitters. And those transmitters are firing continuously as we traverse the site. So each time we drive across the site, we're collecting 22 lines of data and they're just six centimetres apart. Massive increase in data density over what we had um, with the single channel systems. And so that should provide us with much better, more detailed images of the archeology. span Now, that system in the middle is the one that we had on the original time teams. So that's the old Mira. And this is the one we had at Broughton, the Mira HDR. HDR is high dynamic range. So it's the equivalent of going from old school tele to HD or from HD to 4K crisper data. That's the whole idea. Be able to see more subtle features um, and also stronger signals so we can actually push the, the reach of the antenna um, deeper into the ground. So hopefully we can um, get a little bit further than we could before. So let's do the interesting bit now. Let's actually have a look at the data. What we have in front of us is a cube of data. It's showing the extents of our survey area. So that's our east-west extents, our north-south, and then from surface to maximum depth. Except it's not actually maximum depth. I've clipped the data to 1.2 metres because that's where the bulk of the um, archaeology was lying. We actually had stuff that was stretching all the way down to um, almost two metres below the surface. Uh, but once we got to the, the very bottom, there wasn't much to see and a lot, there was a lot of geology um, interacting with the, the GPR signal. So that's our, our kind of primary data set. But um, it's actually useful to us to be able to kind of put that in context, see it um, where it lies in the landscape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop an image behind. There we go. There's our aerial photo of the site. So uh, if I zoom out uh, what we can see is that we have the villa field the field that had the sarcophagus in it and that was also where we had all of our uh, instant room and uh, the big fancy touch screen uh, we we're all sat up there in that corner of the field so let's get back into the bit we're interested in
And what we're looking at at the moment is the first slice, so right at the top surface. Uh, so we can see Z is our depth value, and we can see we're at zero meters, directly beneath the antenna box. And what can we say about the data at this very early stage? Well, we can say that we're starting to see something already. And that shouldn't really come as a surprise to anyone who'd actually visited site because um, where the plough had been going up and down for decades, if not more than that, centuries maybe, um, material from the villa has been dragged up to the surface and actually there were bits of masonry poking up through the soil. So we can start to see the footprint already. Uh, we can also see the ploughing striations. So those are the lines that are running kind of roughly east-west. Um, easier to see them if you kind of look along the line of the data. And uh, we can also see at this end, we've got this big ploughing headland. So that's where the tractor is always going up and down the same bit of the field. So you get more compaction, bigger ruts, and therefore bigger reflections. So the darker the colour, stronger the reflections that we're getting. So let's um, let's start to have a look a little bit deeper into the uh, into the soils. What we see is it starts to get darker, and the reason for that is that we've dropped into the plough soil here. The plough soil is all churned up and we're getting lots and lots of reflections from that churned material. Um, but we can still see there's yeah, the shadow of something in there. And another thing to, to briefly point out is that although this ploughing is all quite close to the surface, um, we'll feel its effect through most of the data. So it tends to reverberate. The reflections we get from those ploughing striations reverberate down through the section. And so we actually see their effect deeper than they exist, uh, which is annoying and quite difficult to remove without risking uh, actually removing the archaeology. So we tend to just put up with it and interpret around it. So let's continue going a little bit deeper. And what we'll see is it will suddenly get lighter and suddenly other stuff will start to pop out. And so that's because we've now got below that plough soil uh, into the subsoil where now there is a bigger contrast between the host material and the archaeology, the demolition rubble primarily at this depth, because we're not getting the same level of reflections from that subsoil as we did from the churned up plough soil. So that we see a bigger contrast with the demolition. And so we see demolition over the villa complex. Um, we see some features associated with the lower terrace where the um, we assume was like garden area. Um, we start to see a few bits and pieces coming into the north and also some kind of smaller complex down to the south. But still, these ploughing striations are um, very apparent. If I chug on a little bit deeper. When we first looked at the data, we very quickly realised that this was not going to be quite as straightforward as we had at first thought. We came to site expecting there to be a big four winged villa um, in a quadrangle, four blocks of um, uh, building all around a central courtyard. What we see from this demolition spread is that might not be the case. So we've got very clear north wing, very clear east wing, definitely stuff happening to the south, but not the same kind of clarity of, of footprint that we have on the other two sides. And then on the west, well, there's just a kind of lack of reflections. Now, that could be for a number of reasons. And the things that we were discussing at the time were, is it because it's a different type of construction? So is it maybe that there's timber stuff there that didn't have the same kind of foundations, has rotted away? Um, is it because there just wasn't any construction on that side of the villa complex? Or is it because the plough has removed everything from that western side? And that's perfectly feasible because actually this is the highest part of the site. And um, the ground drops away on all sides, uh, very much so down to the east, so to the right, uh, very much down to the south and, and gently to the north. But you get hill wash, so the, the, the plough soil tends to move off down slope, and uh, that means that you get less material protecting the archaeology at those higher points. So it's feasible 
that the plough is therefore closer to the archaeology and has drawn more of it out. But one of the counter arguments for that was, well, if we have a look at about this depth, still seeing the demolition, starting to see some of the wall lines popping out on the, the north and eastern range. Southern range, yeah, definitely a spread of something there. Doesn't look quite the same character as the rest. But we have this linear that runs down uh, the western side. And that appears to suggest that perhaps we have a boundary wall to the complex enclosing the courtyard. And actually, if we spin it round and look down from the north, um, we see that it kind of lines up pretty well with the, the ends of the, the demolition spread. Uh, so that's a, a pretty feasible interpretation that that's a, a wall footing. Um, and if it is, well, it hasn't been dragged away by the plough. So if there were other buildings there, we would expect to see the remains of those as well. So questionable western wing needs a bit of excavation to test. Then let's have a look at this southern area. Well, yeah, looks a little bit different again, doesn't it? You know, not not quite the same um, character as we see on the north and the eastern ranges where we see pretty clear sections of, of wall lines. Um, we see some uh, pretty obvious rooms. So we've got one down on the southeast corner, um, another one up on the north east corner. Um, clearly a big long room here that then gives way to smaller divisions. Not getting that same feel through that southern side. And again, you know, the questions arise. Is it a different phase? Is it a different construction? Um, was it that we just actually have, you know, areas of hard standing, maybe with small workshops or something on top of it? You know, clearly it's a little bit different. And there even seems to be a bit of separation between this area of intense activity and the southern uh, focus of reflections. So we have this kind of gap through here. Well, why is that? You know, what's going on? So again, not as simple as we first thought, where we assumed it would just be a continuous kind of ring of, of buildings all the way around the outside. Certainly, that's what the crop mark suggested. And, and the magnetic data seemed to hint towards sort of a similar layout. One of the things that GPR isn't very good at, whereas, you know, it's, it's great for layouts, great for the relative depths of different things. Um, it's not fantastic at giving us an indication of what buildings might have been used for. Um, and it really highlights the benefit of using more than one technique on a site. So the GPR is giving us that detail, giving us the wall lines, giving us the rooms, giving us the extent of the demolition, telling us the difference in relative depth. But the magnetic data is giving us information about what might have been happening in those various buildings because it, it will highlight areas where we've had high temperatures. So areas of burning, hearths, kilns, furnaces, hypercore systems, you know, fired materials like tile. Um, whereas the GPR is a little bit inert on that front. You know, everything looks the same regardless of what it's been used for. So unless there's something really characteristic about the shape and the build, of a particular um, type of, uh, of construction, then it's very difficult for us to make an absolute interpretation. So again, big question marks over what exactly was going on on that southern side of the villa complex. We can see there's a lot of engineering has gone into this site. So we have these linears up here um, now and extending right away through the site and also off down um, to the south. Now, they are probably going to be some kind of water management, bringing water in, taking water away. Um, some of them are going to be field drains and relatively modern at that. And by modern, I mean kind of um, 19th, 20th century. There was a field plan which had some of the drainage systems in it uh, that, uh, that the farmer had provided, uh, the landowner. And uh, so that allows us to kind of discount some of them and say, right, well, we know that this was a drain put in in 1903 or whatever it might be. But some of the others are quite clearly related to the villa. So for example, in the shallower slices, if I come back up, um, we have oops, this feature here that comes down and turns and goes straight into the end of the villa. Well, that has a really nice magnetic signature associated with it as well. So we're pretty happy that that is 
um, something to do with the uh, the Roman site. Then if we go deeper, we see what are probably drains, um, because they're sort of down towards foundation level, uh, coming out of that north range. So heading across the courtyard in this instance, and then not really sure where it goes after that. Uh, but this one here on the right hand side, I just scroll up and down a bit. It seems to come across the courtyard through this area of, of response on the southern side and then curve off down to this region, which was the lowest part of the site, really wet um, and clearly draining down um, towards the uh, stream that sort of made the, the eastern boundary of the field. So lots of water management, lots of engineering, a bit more up here on the, the eastern range going on as well. So, you know, again, just points towards the status of this building. You know, it's been put together very well and, you know, the groundworks have been done very well too. So that's the kind of main villa. If we come right the way down to um, sort of getting close to the maximum depth that I've got uh, in this particular data block, uh, we can see then that the bits of the structure that have probably the deeper foundations um, and uh, the, the deepest sort of core of material. So clearly this, this southeastern building and this northeastern building, and that might be partly to do with the, the topography of the site, the slope of the site, that these needed to be built up further. Uh, then we've got on this eastern range, uh, a whole bunch of reflections here that might suggest that we've got greater depth of material. And in this northwest corner, uh, we have these sort of spots of, of bright spots of, of reflection strength. And so one interpretation of that was, well, are we actually looking at some sort of construction pads, um, either pier bases or, or stone that have been put in to support something directly above them? And if that is the case, if that's what we've got there, because they're too far apart to be pili, the um, small pillars that used to hold up hypercoursed floors, um, that might suggest that this northwestern range, or certainly this end of it, uh, was more than single storey. And so there were piers that held up the first floor. And so they've got fairly substantial foundations beneath them, uh, which are showing up as, as these sort of small discrete pads of uh, increased reflection strength. Move that down. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, extending all the way along and maybe some more um, over this side as well. So there's lots to be gleaned from this data. And from that first look, you know, we were already asking and answering questions very quickly uh, of the main villa complex. And then to the south, always click the wrong button on that, <laughs> to the south, um, we have this other isolated structure, which we knew about from the magnetic data. Um, it was, we could see it in that, and it had been interpreted as an aisled building. Well, certainly we seem to have some kind of concentric structure. Um, that's a little tricky for me to say, so I won't try and do it again. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to be relatively substantial as well. I mean, it's got good depth extent on it, you know, certainly on a par with um, the larger parts of the, uh, the villa building. Uh, and we can see that there's definitely water management that appears to be associated with it. Um, we know we've got a valley running down here. You can actually see some of the wetter ground in the aerial photo. So it's right next to a watercourse. So the obvious questions were, well, is this a bathhouse? Not unusual for them to be um, remote from the, the main villa complex because you would have uh, underfloor heating, fire, um, and you want it to be close to the water. So entirely possible. Again, something which the magnetic data might help with because there was quite a strong magnetic signature in this region. Uh, and again, nothing's going to be pure excavation to get a handle on exactly uh, what the use of this building was and to be able to date it and see whether it's um, uh, contemporary with the rest of the main villa or whether it's uh, you know slightly different phase. So, so far, everything that we've done has been looking at the data set flat. So, completely horizontal and then just running up and down through that, that data block. Another thing that we can do is uh, we can actually apply the topography to it because the data was collected with a GPS. We're collecting not just longitude and latitude, but 
also the elevation above sea level. And if I use a slightly different viewing uh, window, then we'll be able to include that in the data. So here it is with a ridiculously exaggerated vertical scale. And let's just turn the light off on that and reduce that vertical scale a little bit. Uh, I could also actually put in the underlying map as well. So that'll do. And then if we scroll through till we've got some of the building showing nicely there and then zoom in. We can start to see the relationships between the reflections that we've recorded and the topography. So we see that the um, the separate structure is down the slope, as I say, um, towards the lower lying part, but actually on a slight um, plateau. So it is elevated in its own right, uh, but within a lower lying part of the site. And then we see that the um, material associated with the, the wing of the villa um, is actually on the, the sort of shoulder of a platform here, which then drops down into another platform. Um, beneath it, which, as we said earlier, um, is probably some kind of garden enclosure or something like that. But all of it is on this sort of down slope. And what we see is that, sure enough, where that western wing would be is very close to the highest point of the site. And so it's entirely feasible that, yeah, that has been ploughed away. But again, the question mark arises because of um, this potential wall line that seems to run very neatly uh, from the corner of the north range up here down to the corner of the southern range and the fact that that exists and there doesn't seem to be anything else around it um yeah it it's, makes that ploughed out argument maybe a little weaker than perhaps it would have been otherwise but So yeah, final thing before I go is just to have a quick look at the sarcophagus field. Yep, there we go. Great. Let's just that down. Right, so to orientate ourselves, um, we are in a field due south of where the villa field was. So uh, if I zoom right out, there you go, and see how they sit together. And this was a patch that we had cleared of crop. So this was as much as we were able to survey. And the ploughing marks and the, the tractor lines, you can see very, very clearly in this data set. Um, this was a field of beet or something, I think. Uh, so yeah, really, um, really obvious ploughing striations and, and tractor ruts in, in this field. So what's interesting about it was that we wanted to know, was there anything associated with the sarcophagus? Now, if I just scroll through, we don't actually see the top of the sarcophagus, um, too close to the surface, um, not very good for us when things are right at the surface um, and, and relatively small, but we do see the bottom of it. So this actually is the sarcophagus here. Um, it's, <laughs> believe it or not, just that reflection, uh, that reflection. Um, and I mean, one thing it drives home is kind of how insignificant a single burial seems to be when it's just in a landscape on its own. You know, this was someone very high status given how much they'd had spent on their burial, but they're just this tiny little black smear in the data um, compared to the rest of this landscape. So you kind of really get why um, at certain times, people were buried in big mounds, you know, try and impose themselves upon that, that landscape. Uh, but yeah, this is probably the reflection from the base of 
the uh, sarcophagus. So if I store that and then put the radiograms on. So these are our raw material. This is the raw data that we collect. Scroll on through and then uh, zoom in. So these are what we collect. This is all of the reflections as they come into the machine. Very little been done to these. Um, and if I just pop underneath, there you go. You can see this is the reflection that we get from the bottom of that sarcophagus. And we see that it extends a few lines in each direction. So uh, if I step through, see it's pretty consistent. And then it just disappears into general background noise. And flick backwards and forwards through those. So it's very clear in the radar grounds, uh, less clear in the um, time slices, but they're all the same. It's this one here. But what's immediately to the north of it is what is potentially interesting um, because <laughs> if we're Utterly honest, we don't know what it is. Um, we managed to get into this area and, and, and do the survey because the, the farmer had very kindly cleared the crops. And what we found is this massive spread of reflections. And you see they kind of shift north south as we go up and down through the data set. But um, we're on a slope here. So uh, that could be something that's horizontal. And then obviously the, the slope is coming down. And so we kind of see its apparent depth changing um, as we go shallow and deeper. But we don't really know what it is. It, it, I mean, it could be geological. It's entirely possible. It's big enough to be geological. Uh, but we don't see that kind of response anywhere else on the site, or certainly not where we've done the survey over the, um, the villa. So potentially the geology could be a bit different uh, up on this side of the hill. But there are some bits of this that feel like they're really well defined, you know, very clear edges, um, sort of hints of, of a rectilinear distribution to it. But then at other times it just looks way more amorphous and it looks way more kind of natural. Uh, so without seeing more of this, we can't really be sure exactly what it is that we're looking at. Um, and we didn't have a choice because we couldn't get on to um, the rest of the field. So is it something big that that is uh, important and, and that's how come there's a burial next to it? Or if we look more shallow, we notice these linears and we wondered whether those were um, roadside ditches because they certainly head off down towards the villa and it's not unusual to have burials next to, to ditches. But that would kind of suggest that, well, Whatever this is, isn't contemporary with that road because obviously one is ploughing straight through the middle of the other. Um, and it would be a bit odd to kind of have an access road and, and then build something directly uh, within it. Or does that road go over the top of something that was pre-existing? We really can't see enough of it to be able to make an interpretation. So this is one of those kind of tantalising mysteries that will have to wait for the next phase of investigation. And I always think that's kind of part of the fun of Time Team was, you know, answering the questions that we could and maybe setting up for um, more work to be done in the future.